this video. We will discuss some highlight clinical manifestations related to certain diseases. So let's start with our first clinical presentation and its associated diseases. I will show you the histological picture or anything related to the clinical finding. Uh, then we will discuss about the picture and the clinical finding that is shown in this picture and what is the uh, diagnosis. So over here, we have a ferruginous body, okay? This is your histological finding in interstitial lung disease. That is a result of inorganic dust inhalation. So what, what happened that macrophages ingestion of the inorganic fiber results in a fibrotic reaction with encasement of the fiber in iron-rich material that is derived from the proteins such as ferritin and hemosiderin. So in the exam, they will not say that ferruginous body. There will be a statement that, okay, we are going to see iron-containing nodules in alveolar septum. Then you need to come up with the diagnosis. What is the diagnosis? The diagnosis is asbestosis. Our next, over here, we see honeycomb appearance on the x-ray or CT scan. So this one is clustered cystic spaces. They are between 3 to 10 millimeter in diameter. Occasionally, they can be as large as 2.5 centimeter. Uh, they are usually subpleural, peripheral, or basal in distribution. So where do we see honeycomb lung? We see that in idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Next one. What is that? Crushman's spirals. So what are Crushman's spirals? They are going to say desquamated epithelial cast in septum. So what is it? It's our microscopic finding in the sputum of asthmatic patients. So they are spiral shaped mucus plugs from subepithelium mucus gland, ducts of the bronchi. They may occur in several different lung diseases. Um, so they may refer to the parts of the desquamated epithelium. So that what we are going to see in the asthmatic patients. So where are we going to see Crushman spirals in bronchial asthma? So this is our spiral. They will give you this histology and they will ask you, where do we see it? So desquamated epithelial cast in sputum of asthmatic patients. Next one. What do we see over here? charcoal laden crystals. So these are microscopic crystals. They are composed of eosinophilic protein and it's found in people who are allergic, uh, who have allergic diseases such as our asthma patients or parasitic pneumonia. So the clinical finding, what they are going to say, eosinophilic granules, hexagonal, double-pointed, needle-like crystals in bronchial secretions. So we see eosinophils in bronchial secretions will have needle-like crystals. Where are we going to see that? Bronchial asthma or patients who have parasitic pneumonia also. You can find those. charcoal laden crystals. They are not going to say that name. Sometimes they can, but the mostly they will be describing this structure. Next one. What are those? These are lines of Zen, like layers of platelets and RBCs. So this is a characteristic of thrombi that appears when formed in the heart or aorta. So they are visible in microscopic laminations. They are produced by alternating pale layers of platelets mixed with fibrin. Okay, so these platelets are mixed with fibrin and darker layer that's containing the RBCs. So their significance, what they apply, this is the R, arterial thrombosis. Means that thrombosis at a site of rapid blood flow, so that thrombi is made of white or red layers. We have lines of Zen. So this is our platelets mixed with fibrin, and then you will see a darker layer over here. That's your RBCs. What is the diagnosis? Arterial thrombos. Next, what we see? Rinky crystals. So rinky crystals, look at the pointer over here. So rectangular crystal-like cytoplasmic inclusion in leading cells. So these are eosinophilic uh, hexagonal crystals, okay? They are composed of three beta hydroxy steroid dehydrogenase and we will found them in uh, the cytoplasm and they are the pathognomic for leading cell tumor. 
So ring keys crystals, rectangular crystal-like cytoplasmic inclusions. So these are going to be found in the cytoplasm. This is over here. It's pretty um, easy to not able to see this one because it's pretty light over here. But the description of the question will help you that, okay, this is a leading cell tumor. And what they are talking about over here is ring key crystals. So next we have shallow dual bodies. Okay, again, that's what glomerulus structure surrounding vessel in germ cells. Glomerulus structure that surrounding vessel in germ cells. So what is it? Central vessel surrounded by tumor cells. Okay, we are going to see that in yolk sac tumor. Memory gland blue dome cyst. This is a blue dome. So this is a cross, a gross specimen that is showing you a blue dome cyst. Uh, they are separated by dense connective tissue. Okay. And these are cysts. They are filled with dark fluid and they stick out from the surrounding connective tissue because they are filled with dark connective tissue, uh, dark uh, fluid. Uh, fat will appear yellow over here and fibrinous uh, tissue will appear white. And these are your non-proliferative fibrocystic changes that will appear blue. So these are our non-proliferative fibrocystic changes. So where we are going to see, we are going to see in fibrocystic change of the breast. So dilated cysts, they are filled with fluid, fibrosis in between the fat and cyst. Okay, so it's ductal dilation, blue domed. Chocolate cyst of the ovary. So these are your non-cancerous. They are fluid filled cysts. They typically form deep within the ovaries. Uh, and why they are called as chocolate cysts? Uh, because they are brown, tar color appearance, and something that looks like a melted chocolate, but it's an old blood that has been accumulated. In. So they are also called as ovarian endometriomas. So we are going to see them in endometriosis. Frequently, these involve both ovaries. Next, call exner bodies. So what are those? These are um, like a follicle-like appearance and they are small eosinophilic uh, fluid-filled punched out spaces between the granulosa cells. So between the granulosa cells, we have fluid-filled um, bodies over here and the granulosa cells are usually arranged haphazardly around the space. So this is your disarrayed um, granulosa cells arranged around the collections of eosinophilic fluid. So these are known as call exner uh, bodies and we will see them in granulosa cell tumor of the ovary. Next, sheets of uniform fried egg cells. This is over here. So these are your epithelial cells and they are flat and smooth and they are look like tiny fried egg because this is yolk and that's your white egg okay and um, so that's why they call it like that so what we have we can see that in certain diseases like this uh, germinoma oligodendrosa uh, oligodendroglioma multiple myeloma here is a leukemia seminoma and mycoplasma pneumonia so these are the one that we are going to see so mycoplasma pneumonia uh, will grow uh, fried egg colonies in eaton agar oligodendroglioma will give rise as the chicken wire pattern and fried egg appearance of the cells because of the perinuclear halo. Hairy cell leukemia uh, is with this hair projections. They have hair projections in my last video of high yield hematology images. I have pointed out that they have hair like projections. So they are going to give rise to fried egg appearance in the bone marrow biopsy also. Seminoma uh, with its clear cytoplasm and round nuclei may also give uh, rise to fried egg appearance under the microscope. Okay, and so these are different uh, conditions where we are going to see fried egg appearance. Next, next we have dysplastic squamous cervical cancer with resinoid uh, like nuclei and hyperchromosemia. So what we see over here, this is your, this is your colonocytes. Colonocytes are like your squamous cells, and they are infective productively with human papilloma virus 
An important hallmark will be irregular peripheral collapse of the keratins, leaving clear space around the nucleus. So around the nucleus, we got the clear space over here. Okay, the collapse of the keratins. This is induced by E4 gene of uh, human papilloma virus, and they are going to uh, decrease the strength of the epithelium, and that's how a virus will. Uh, shed and human papilloma virus also induces unscheduled DNA synthesis and that's going to result in poly uh, polydization and under physiological conditions so it's not uh, you cannot measure it okay so what where are we going to see uh, coleocytes in our cervical cancer Circular grouping of dark tumor cells surrounding pale humerite rosettes neurofibrils. These are the ones. Okay. Where do we see these? So this is like a circular grouping of dark tumor cells surrounding pale neurofibrils. So small blue cell tumors from the uh, neurocrest and uh, ectoderm. So they come from there. Where are we going to find those? We are going to see those in neuroblastoma, medulloblastoma, and retinoblastoma. Next one. Pseudopelocyting polyomorphic tumor cells on brain biopsy. So what is it? It's a pseudopelocyting necrosis in glioblastoma. Uh, so we will see that they had garnal like uh, arrangement of the hypercellular tumor nuclei. So this is your tumor okay, nuclei lining up around the irregular foci of tumor necrosis. So this is your tumor necrosis over here. Okay, and they are going to contain the pignotic nuclei. So these are the pignotic nuclei. The arrowhead are the pignotic nuclei. This is your uh, necrosis, and that's are your uh, hypercellular tumor nuclei. And they are also showing us over here tumor vessel. So this is our tumor vessel. So this is known as like we have the necrosis over here in pseudo palisiding. So we're going to see this kind of, this kind of histology in glioblastoma. Multiformer. Next, pig bodies. So pig bodies, what are we going to see? That these are silver staining spherical aggregation of tau proteins and neurons. So over here, this is going to be, they said that balloon type shape, okay? Pig bodies in frontal cortex, and then tau proteins are there. So we will see that in frontotemporal dementia. Neurofibrillary tangles. These are your protein aggregates and neurons from hyperphosphorylation or phosphorylation of tau proteins. We are going to see those in Alzheimer's disease and pig disease. Neurofibrillary tangles again. So these are over here. Uh, we have our A beta plaques. These are the brown ones. They are showing us that those are the plaques. And the neurofibrillary tangles are your dark browns over here. The tangles, and then we are so, uh, showing the amyloid, A beta amyloid protein. Senile plaques, extracellular amyloid dep deposition in gray matter of the brain. Okay, amyloids. So this was is just a different color staining, and this is the one um, they use the brown over here. So either way, they can give you in the test. Okay, so next over here, we have depigmentation of neurons in substantia nigra. So look at that. That's over here is your normal number of neurons in the substantia nigra, and they are pigmented. Look at that. They are pigmented. And now over here, we have loss of neuron and loss of pigmentation with Parkinson's disease. So whenever you see the depigmentation of neurons in substantia nigra, means that there is loss of pigments and loss of neurons. Where do we see that? In Parkinson's disease. Then we have Levy bodies. Levy bodies are described as eosinophilic cytoplasmic inclusion in neurons. So this is your neuron nucleus, and we will see Levy bodies there. Okay, where are we going to see that condition? It, we will see in Levy body dementia, and also sometimes you are going to see in Parkinson's disease. 
bloody or yellow tap on lumbar puncture, xenochromia. So xenochromia, they give us yellow color. So yellow color in the supernatant of the centrifuge uh, cerebrospinal fluid within an hour or less after collection is usually is a result of previous bleeding. So when we see this color, it means this is a result of previous bleeding and where this bleeding is coming from, this is going to be subarachnoid hemorrhage. And it may be caused by increased cerebrospinal fluid proteins, melanin from meningeal uh, or carotenoids. So xenochromia is the presence of bilirubin in the cerebrospinal fluid, okay? And th this is your positive marker that a patient is suffering from an acute subarachnoid hemorrhage. So it's very important finding that is going to distinguish between a traumatic tap or a subarachnoid hemorrhage, okay? So this is going to be our yellow color or sometimes it's bloody also. Keratin poles on biopsy. So this is over here, found in region where abnormal squamous cells form concentric layers. So there's are going to be a layers over here, okay? Also called as epithelial pearls. So you're going to see in squamous cell carcinoma. Next one. Antidesmal gland, antidesmosome antibodies. So desmal gland is a cadherin like adhesion molecule that functions to maintain the tissue integrity and facilitate cell 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 to cell communication so we are going to see antibodies over here and this is a condition is associated with pumphigus vulgaris and in that condition we see blistering next Antitopoisomerase antibodies. So these antitopoisomerase antibodies are autoantibodies. They are directed against topoisomerase. And uh, most importantly, where do we find that? We find that in our autoimmune diseases because they react with self-proteins. And they are also referred to as anti-DNA topoisomerase 1 antibody. And mostly we are going to see that in diffuse scleroderma. Anti-centromere antibodies. Okay, so anti-centromere antibodies, these are autoantibodies specific to centromere, okay, function. They occur in uh, autoimmune diseases. Uh, where do we see that? In our scleroderma crest syndrome. Thank you, everyone. I hope this video was a source of information for you. Thank you.